Um, and what we're going to see today, I hope, is the culmination of a lot of effort that's gone in over the last few years to trying to see how we can engineer these uh, great developments that the physicists and the chemists have made out there and how we can develop them into um, real world applications and how we can get them onto roofs, how we can get them into buildings, how we can um, get them onto UAVs. There's this, this such an exciting wealth of things that Perovskite can do. So Bob, before we start, this is what we're all um, familiar with uh, and a very classical architecture there of the Mesoporous Titania. And I'll come on to the, the variability in architectures in the next few slides. Um, it's, it's really the next slide that I want to uh, focus on a little bit. And this is what's going to set the context of today's, uh, today's discussions. Uh, it's the versatility of this material. I think we find ourselves in a very fortunate uh, situation for those scientists and engineers is that we can all have a crack at something in this field and, and develop and push forward um, uh, this, this area. So low temperature fabrication is one of those brilliant um, capabilities that planar perovskites offers that allows us to do work on plastics and, and metals. Um, pretty low materials costs, um, but there's still work to be done in some of the materials. So that's, that's always good news. There's still work to be done. Um, we can solution process, but not only solution process, we can vacuum de deposit. Um, so it lends itself to both of these things. It's tunable, uh, which means that we can adjust uh, the band gap that allows us to do different things, uh, which makes it suitable for, for tandems, for example, so, and, and, and perhaps we'll hear a little bit about that later. Uh, this is an interesting one, capital costs. Um, there's no requirement to, to super purify silicon when you're depositing a perovskite, um, at least not in, in a single junction. And so it offers us a real opportunity to smash down those capital costs for a fabrication plant. And of course, they're also lightweight. And what this does is feeds into all of these sorts of, and this is a non-exhaustive list by far of all the applications that Perovskite can do. And we're going to hear, for example, about the Internet of Things from David at the end of the of the day. Um, but BIPV, LEDs, UAV, space applications, photodetectors, these are just a small branch. And so there are people, I hope, um, listening out there who are not only working in um, developing the left column, but also in applying into the right column. And, and certainly those those groupings need to be working together, and they are. And, and, and so perovskite is an incredibly collaboratively driven field. Um, I absolutely love it. And, and it's, it's great that, that we see so much of it out there. Um, and there's a lot of choice. And that's one of the things that I think a lot of us enjoy. Uh, and it's both good. Um, but on a wet Monday morning where your, your team is trying to decide, you know, whether you've chosen the right architecture to pursue your development, it's often um, a tricky one. Uh, it, it evolved from the mesoscopic structures um, that you can see on the top left there, A and B. Uh, and then we realized that we could get some um, great performances. Uh, we, by the way, being the community, of course, not me personally, I should say. Um, C and D, we realized that we could get really good planar um, devices without the mesopore structure, although it does give you added advantages in some areas. Um, uh, without hull transporter, without electron transporter, this, this really versatile material without a, a top contact made of gold, one of made of carbon. And then to the right of, of G then, we have this rather different um, architecture, this triple mesoscopic structure, which is fully printed without any evaporated contacts. And, I, and I, we're going to be hearing plenty about that from Professor Han later on. And then the final two on the edge then are these wonderful uh, um, tandem devices that we see now so much uh, development going on, both in perovskite silicon tandems and perovskite perovskite tandems. So some, some really exciting work going on in that area over the last few years. For the engineers amongst us and others and physicists and chemists as, as well, um, how do you deposit it? Well, we all know the classical method, of course, which is spin coating, but there are so many others. And, and all of these uh, techniques have been deployed on perovskites to make successful devices. So again, not only versatility in the behavior of the material, but the versatility in the process window, that the ability to deposit uh, perovskites. Um, but we're all out there to, to overcome spin coating. So spin coating, I think we all know, is a really great technique. Here is uh, our spin coater at Swansea. I'm sure yours is uh, much, much cleaner in order to get your high efficiency devices. Uh, the application of the perovskite and then the application of the um, anti-solvent. Uh, the spin is finished, it's removed um, and then placed onto a hot plate. And in those two processes, using those two pieces of, of relatively low cost equipment, we have a working perovskite material, not a device, but we have at least the film. And in that time, we've achieved a lot. Actually, we've removed the solvent, we've nucleated the perovskite, we've grown the grains, we've thinned the film. Uh, that's actually quite a lot of, of chemistry has gone on in those two rapid processes. Um, and in fact, 
if we take a closer look at what's happened, we've thinned the solvent, we've evaporated it, and we've achieved all these things at a relatively uh, appropriate rate. What has happened, though, is we've used quite a lot of material compared to what we put down, and we've only deposited small samples. So although uh, spin coating is a wonderful technique, it doesn't lend itself necessarily to scale up. Although you can scale up with spin coating, I don't want to suggest that you can, and it, and it is being done. But what you can do when you compare spin coating in the top there to something, for example, like roll-to-roll -roll slot die coating, is that you can do a lot more area. So you typically in spin coating work with small samples uh, and you use a lot of solution. It's relatively slow because you have to go back and forth to the spin coater to the hot plate. And I'm sure there's hundreds of you out there who know this only too well and are desperate to get back into the labs um, to do this again, as, as is my team. Um, and down in the bottom then is roll to roll coating. So in a 20 minute coat, we were able to do 156 square centimeters via spin coating and 18,000 square centimeters using our roll to roll roll coaters. So, and we want to be pushing forward and, and th there is a lot of um, opportunity to do that. And we'll be hearing from the likes of Aldo and Hong Wei and David about that later. We can do it via roll to roll. And we can do it via to sheet to sheet. I think we might be seeing elements of both of those today. And what's nice is that the the, the the, uh, the world is and the global community is pushing forward. So now we have an, a module, a champion module efficiency, and we can see that, uh, brilliant to see the perovskite has, has made an appearance, and we're starting to see small modules um, being tested to a high standard and appearing um, competitively, then I guess you could say, on these champion module efficiencies. And, and the more of these sorts of um, entries that we get for, for perovskite, the better. And we can see that all the effort that's going on out there by you, uh, is is being translated. So uh, again, another non-exhaustive list of the challenges that might might be faced, and 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 one could build an entire career on anything within these um, circles. And people have done, and they can write theses. A module design and process time, for example, how quickly does it take to deposit something? We can we can use near infrared, for example, to do it rapidly, or photonic. The interconnects and patterning I'll discuss in, in the next slide. Automation is an interesting one. We saw there quite a lot of movement between the spin quarter in order to produce a small, relatively small area. How do we automate it and how does the perovskite handle being automated? Um, stability encapsulation, where we're going to hear from Henry uh, in the next talk about stability. And we've also seen some nice um, ISO standards being um, presented and how do we come together and make sure that when we assess stability, we do it in a very structured way and, and that everybody can understand what it is that our devices have undergone. Solver compatibility, we do not want to dissolve the underlayer when we apply our whole transporter or our electron transporter. Um, and, and what's a really nice challenge for the engineers is the coating and drying parameters. They change every time you change your perovskite. So we'll be seeing from Michael later some really interesting polyelemental and multi-component parts of, of the perovskite. And uh, what's an interesting challenge for us down the line is, you know, what does that do to the way in which we deposit the materials? And it's a really great challenge every time we see these new developments coming through. So very briefly to wrap up, um, just because of the context of the next few, few talks, uh, module design can come in two different ways, really, generally, which is series connected, where um, the ele top electrode is connected to the bottom electrode, and, and then the charge is passed through each of these strips. The voltage, therefore, is proportional to the number of cells. And then parallel connected, where you effectively just put two electrodes on top of each other, and there's no overlapping of the electrodes. You connect one and the other. And we'll perhaps be seeing that later in, in Hong Wei's discussion. Um, and then interconnection, which I think we'll see in Aldo's talk, uh, where it's this requirement to, to, to produce a series connected device. You do need to overlap one, um, one electrode with the other, and you have to remove material either using a laser or a mechanical scribe in order to allow that to happen. So you remove material, you make subsequent depositions, and then you can get an electrode to sit over the, the underlying electrode, therefore, in order to get this pathway that you might get in a, in a standard series connected module. And, and how does perovskite um, respond to modules? How does it respond to interconnections? Well, very differently depending on what material you use, which is why we've got some of the great work that we're gonna hear um, today. Just final slide to say that there are people uh, out there, including ourselves and Salience and NREL and CSIRO and, and many others that are pushing the boundaries of, of how do we get manufacturing at scale. We will get there. Um, and it's these sorts of con conferences that help us to understand all the great developments that are going out there. 